Hey, there she is. Oh, okay. There. Excellent. Perfect. Sorry, folks. <laughs> no worries. All right, now that we're all set up here, I'm just going to push my tabs around. Sure. I felt like I was doing that old ad. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I don't know what cell phone carrier that was, but. All right. Well, I think we're up. We're ready to go. You all set, Sarah? I am all set and excited. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. It's a beautiful, sunny day here in Nova Scotia. So thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, my name is Jeff Henniger. Uh, I'm a teacher in the Halifax area, and I'm working with Brilliant Labs right now to support teachers around Nova Scotia. And my name is Sarah Ryan, and I am program director for Brilliant Labs Nova Scotia. I've been in this role for, I guess, over six years now, and I'm happy to be joining you, and thank you as well for taking the time on such a beautiful day. All right. Oh, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so we're just going to do a little bit of an introduction as far as what we're going to be discussing today. Um, and um, of course, we're going to have some time for some questions at the end. I do realize there's a bit of a delay, so we'll account for that. But uh, today we're going to be covering who is Brilliant Labs, if you're not familiar with who we are and what we do, um, why we've been focused on maker-centered learning and maker education for the past uh, over six years in Nova Scotia and across the Maritimes and Atlantic provinces, um, how we can infuse uh, making into the curriculum so that you could use it within the classroom um, and align it with your outcomes, as well as some examples of projects that we've supported over the past couple of years. And and then we'll open it up for questions and discussions. So uh, Brilliant Labs is a not-for-profit uh, organization. Um, we are also have charitable status too. So we, have, we started off in New Brunswick going on, I guess, over seven years ago, um, expanded into Nova Scotia in 2015. And um, our role is to work along with our partners um, at the Department of Education and uh, to deliver maker-centered learning. So that could be anything from something that's high-tech. So, you know, or what's deemed high-tech, that's a bit different to everybody in their opinion, but uh, it could be code, robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, as well as combine it with traditional making skills such as sewing, um, woodworking, uh, crafting, and really, incorporating how we can take those different skills together to make projects and, and to encourage an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, as of now, we have over 20 full-time employees. So when I started with the organization in 2015, it was myself, and Jeff, Jeff Wilson, our executive director, and another lady, Kim DeVoe, who's since moved on. So three of us in Nova Scotia, and we're happy to have grown and expanded um, beyond New Brunswick and Nova Scotia to PEI Newfoundland. Um, we, we work with, uh, we align what we're trying to do as far as promoting maker education with other organizations, um, our main partner being the Department of Education, so that we can bring the exciting aspect of making, doing, and enhancing digital literacy and digital skill building, along with things that are relevant to all curriculum um, when possible, and, and that changes every day so that we come up with new projects. Um, we've. To this day, we've approximately it's been about 4,000 projects we've supported um, over the past six and a half years, seven years, across Atlantic Canada. And um, I'm sure that many of you here may or may not have worked with us, but uh, if you're new to Brilliant Labs and the concept, we'll talk about how we can support you later on in the presentation. Um, so just to get started, we just thought we would share some of the different things that Bryant Labs is doing to support teachers across Nova Scotia. Um, so since uh, since COVID started and since, uh, you know, pandemic things and people started working from home more, we, we really have uh, upped our online presence of things that we offer people online and different resources for people to draw from. So uh, some of those will be in the mix here. So the first one that we wanted to share with you was our Brilliant Labs B Board. Um, so, some people might be familiar with a device called a microbit, which is just a small uh, microcomputer that you can code and you can, uh, it can interact with other devices and you can do all kinds of fun things with it. 
But at Brilliant Labs, we developed, um, it's kind of like an extension for the micro bit. So they work together and the B-Board really just opens up all, all these different possibilities for students to do some prototyping in the classroom. So basically any, any kind of project where a student might say like, can we build something that will do this? The answer with the B-Board is usually, is usually yes. Like we've had projects where students are uh, making their own remote control cars and coding them to work. We've had schools ask us, can we automate our greenhouse outside to uh, to turn the fans on and to water the plants by itself? And with this this device, it's, it's yes. So there's so many different things that we can do. Um, and the level of coding is at our students' level. So it's not something that's, you know, you have to hire an engineer for anymore. The tools are are available. So if, uh, if this sounds like something that you are interested in that might work well for your students, uh, then definitely reach out to us because we would love to bring the B-Board into more Nova Scotia classrooms. So now we're going to discuss a little bit about our project um, support that we do offer. So we've been offering this um, since beginning of time uh, for, for Public Labs in Nova Scotia so that we can support teachers and students with the uh, equipment and materials to work on these projects that are related to maker center education. Um, in, in addition to that, we've created a really great database, a library, if you will, of projects that have been done by, completed by, by teachers and students in Nova Scotia and across Atlantic Canada for inspiration. Um, and the process to request uh, support through a project is through our website and um, the credentials or the criteria, sorry, that you would need in order to uh, to be approved um, are listed, but we're pretty open with working with teachers to make sure that we get to a yes. We don't we don't like to say no. Um, we don't support things with devices and requests like that. We really want to see it more of a something that you can build on. But um, we're more than willing to work with you if you have an idea, but you really don't know where to start. Um, uh, we can you can either take a look at our da database and previous projects um, or reach out to, so that we can help you plan with that. And uh, it, by September of this year, we will have approximately 250 projects um, available as inspiration. So these are things that are done from um, teach, done by teachers and students of all ages from grades primary up to 12, and some of them are community projects that have taken place. So lots of ways to get inspired. Um, so it's okay if you don't know what you want to do yet, we can kind of help you out with that. And you know, if you have a one idea, if you just say, I really, really like to use this resource, what can I start off with? We're here to help. Sir, I've got the slide up for the uh, the projects page, the where they can find all our projects or maker funds and stuff. Perfect. Yeah. So. Um, with the Maker Fund, so when we had the school closures initially back in March 2020, um, we really jumped into seeing how we could provide activities on a daily basis that teachers and students could access to do with at-home learning or when, you know, even if they were outside of school time. So um, with that being said, uh, the funding information in order to apply is, is a different kind of thing, but where with the Maker Fund, these are Ideally, we try to keep them low tech so that these are projects that could be accessed by people at home so that you don't necessarily have a robot at home, but something you can still do to infuse that maker-centered learning into what you're doing. And then we also have digital skill build building, which is more focused on um, doing things, not necessarily having to have the equipment, but also being, being able to access the internet and going on open source pages to to work on the digital skills such as coding and machine learning. Um, and then we also have the natural um, maker fun stuff, which is really geared towards the outdoor learning and doing stuff within nature, which is low tech as well. Um, so in response to, to, like I said, the school closures, we really took into account how we could support as many teachers and students um, with, given the situation where they're not in the classroom. But these are readily available at all times. And um, we've had a lot of great response from uh, from from a lot of them and, and during our at-home learning, Jeff uh, and I presented a few of them and it's really great to be able to still continue, continue as a maker-centered learning um, with what you have at home.
Nice. One of my favorite things about that project page is you can filter projects because there's there's hundreds of them. You can filter through them by subjects, but you can also uh, filter through by sustainable development goals. So if there was some specific topic related uh, to those kinds of things, you could filter through. Uh, but there's actually not a filter for grade. So you can't be like, I teach grade three. What do you have on this project for grade three? Because uh, we, we kind of go with the, uh, the idea that a project or like these ideas that we have on this project page, they are very low floor and high ceiling. So, um, so for a lower elementary class, they might be doing this kind of like an entry and maybe following along more with what we're doing. But we're hoping that the teachers, you know, in grade nine, 10, 11, 12 can take that same idea and adapt it and make it work for their students. Like how far could, could those students um, take that idea of, you know, making home for bees. Like a, we called it a pollinator hotel was one of our activities. How far could could another grade uh, like take it knowing what they know, like once their knowledge is built up. So uh, that's kind of a fun thing to see how different teachers and students of all ages are taking this basic idea from this project page and really uh, using it at their own level. They're really, sca the ability to scaffold on that and also have some some students become taking ownership and being able to mentor perhaps uh, the younger grades to do the project and how they can adapt it themselves to either build on it um, in progression or or also to to make it a little bit simpler and then uh, present it to their peers yeah we just had a question in the chat about the filters uh, andrew was asking if there's a tech filter so there is a filter what we call the digital skills so once you check that box off it narrows it down to, you know, there's there's going to be scratch projects in there and you could further filter to link those with specific SDGs. So uh, it's not like you could say, you know, I want only projects that have to do with 3D printing. You'd have to type some things in the search boxes as well to find filters like that. But uh, just for digital skills, that is a filter. And we kind of did that one. Um, so just in terms of Sarah and I and the kinds of support that we are offering teachers in Nova Scotia, uh, there's this whole list. And, and basically the idea is that we can cater to, to what you need and what you want for, for any kind of uh, support. So for example, if you are making a project idea and you just want to have somebody to bounce ideas off of, we're happy to do that, that kind of consultation and just to talk to people about the projects and you know, be that that ear or that uh, you know to throw some ideas around. Uh, we have equipment that we can loan out. Sarah mentioned that we have project grants that we can help you get funding for your classrooms. Uh, so all that kind of stuff we can do. We we uh, lead sessions, but we also really enjoy it when we get to co-teach. So if you would like to be the leader, but have us there as support virtually as it is right now, mm -hmm. um, we love to do that kind of stuff. So whatever you need from us to uh, to feel like you are comfortable and confident in what you're doing with bringing Maker Center Learning to your classrooms, we are here to support you in that way. Yeah, and if you're if you're new to the concept, um, we can also put you in touch with a lot of teachers who we we kind of um, given the name Champion Teachers uh, and Jeff it was Jeff Hedegaard, you were one of our original ones along with Nick uh, Basquale to who really jumped in on this uh, going on six years ago, and um, you know there's a lot of teachers out there who are doing it, and sometimes it can be feel a little bit you know, overwhelming to get into something like that. But when you talk to colleagues or, you know, Jeff and myself, um, we can make sure that it's not something that is extra to be added to your already full plate. I like to kind of um, equate it to like you do, you know, teaching, you've got a lot to cover. We're not there to add an extra scoop of mashed potatoes. We're there to add like a little bit of spice or something that, you know, you've already have enough to eat, but, or to do, but we're, we're there to support and, uh, you know, add to and, and, and just kind of infuse into what you already plan on doing in, in whatever way we can. Nice. All right, so Sarah is going to uh, just give us a little bit more background about what we mean by that maker-centered learning. So you can take it away there, Sarah. Yeah, so maker-centered learning, um, it's kind of, it's nothing new. Um, we've been doing it. We've felt likely we've all been doing it since kids. Um, it's project-based learning. Um, it's experimental. Uh, it's hands-on and it's not necessarily always high tech. It could be low tech or the combination of both, as I mentioned before. Um, 
it's essentially the idea of learning through exploration. So, you know, there isn't really a right or wrong answer. It's a sharing of skills too. So if you have a maker space or you have maker card or something like that, it's having students and yourself working together to take your interests and the skills that you have and really imply, apply them to what you're doing. So some people may be super interested in doing things like sewing and knitting and that sort of thing. And then other people may be really into doing coding, but it's bringing together our what we enjoy doing and what we're skilled to do, but also learning from each other. Um, and so students can really take, like they could take ownership over their own learning by saying, oh, hey, you know what? I really do this at home or my mom or dad does that. So that we're all recognizing that, you know, we wanna get to the same goal of, of you know, education and reaching outcomes, but there's many ways to do that and bringing people together to, um, to be engaging and to be fun and, and once there's that ownership over the education and building on these skills, it's something that goes beyond the classroom. It truly becomes realistic as far as, hey, you know what? I, you know, we don't expect kids in grade three to figure out what they want to do. I mean, I wanted to be an astronaut. I think a lot of us did. But once we are engaged by other people's interests and in, in skill building, then and have the tools to do so, it kind of happens naturally. I like to liken it to the old uh, movie, Field of Dreams. If, if you build it, they will come. If you give the students um, and the educators the tools to work with, um, then, then they will build it and they will learn from doing, learn from making. So it's, it's pretty natural, I think, as, as we're kids, as children, to watch even toddlers, that that's a great way to the hands-on approach rather than versus the old, you know, kind of memorization and regurgitation. Um, and it really, at, it really allows for the teacher at times, of course, to be there for support and guide, but to step back and watch the, I like to call it the magic that happens in the classroom. So there's also, an, <laughs> not to use too many old adages or idioms, but uh, the sage on the stage versus the guide on the side. So you're there to do exactly what you're supposed to do as an educator, but uh, letting, letting the youth kind of have a bit more um, freedom to work and build and share. Um, so, uh, how can we kind of engage and inspire these projects within the classroom, um, at home, within the community? So it's exactly what I said, is that we provide the resources um, and the tools that are interested. So instead of giving, you know, possibly the same set of things to a whole class, it is very dependent on the project and, and the outcomes of what's expected from, from this project. but. This leads into, like I said, for students to realize that they can be the change makers, that there's, you know, we're in the 21st century and our 21st century learning is kind of a um, something that's said a lot, but essentially taking what's happening in the classroom and looking at how um, students can be the can can be the change makers. They can look around them and solve problems, whether it's something within the classroom, within their school, their community. Um, it's sparking the realization that what they're learning and doing in the classroom is actually relevant and really, really important for themselves, their family, their friends, their schools, taking that uh, responsibility and creating um, a certain degree of social um, empathy, a social responsibility, so that when they see that they've made something, it just it just be, being able to make something from start to finish is great. It's so rewarding, and I see that even when my son's making something, we were doing a paper quilling craft, and he was watching me getting started, and he thought, I can't do that. It's too hard, and he wanted to use a glue gun versus the white glue, but there's so much experiment going on that in the end, he came out really proud with what he made. Um, now, if you were to say, well, you know, how can how could you use that to um, to help other people or to you know maybe look at the United Nations SDGs? Um, you could say you know depending on what the project is, uh, simply creating something um, that you might share with people who are um, in retirement homes or people who are don't have a lot of um, access to family members, just being able to share things or looking at the support that you can do through assisted living devices, which we're going to talk about later. But um, it's the entrepreneurial spirit and that comes naturally to youth. Um, I know that I was, but age five out at the end of my driveway selling painted rocks and charging my parents a dollar to listen to me play piano <laughs> after the lessons they they paid for but it's it's kids want to be able to make money but 
we also want to we want to key in that the entrepreneurial spirit isn't just necessarily about making money. It is about um, being able to take your own ideas and realizing that you can create and make that way. Nice. So just to get you to think about something uh, that you've done before. So I think of a time when maybe you built something from Ikea or something similar, like maybe it's that bookshelf or you got a new dresser. And uh, how did it make you feel when you were done building it? So you can either just throw that in the chat or just think about that for a second. What are some of the words that might describe that feeling of completing that, that, that new piece of furniture? <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll just mention, I have, I did not, I've never built anything from Ikea. I did um, stay in an Airbnb for a trip to Maker Faire um, on an Ikea bed that fell apart. <laughs> so I don't know how that person felt when they were making it, but I'm going to say that it, I felt empathetic towards them because Obviously, I think they would have tried to do their best and they wouldn't want it to fall apart. And I didn't really do anything to me. <laughs> I sat on it, the whole thing broke. So I know that I felt frustrated using that result. Nice. I see some in the chat now. So proud, accomplished, a feeling of relief, all those kinds of feelings are <laughs> fantastic. Uh, so this is linking to there was there was a study on uh, on people's you know, on this idea of making. So this is called the Ikea effect. So in that study, they found that people put a higher value on something that they built themselves, like an Ikea bookshelf, um, versus something that's in their home that maybe costs more, uh, or maybe it's made of better materials. So because the person took the time and they invested in it and they created it themselves, it had a higher intrinsic value to them. So I think this really uh, connects with what we're doing in schools as well. We, we assign higher value to things that we've had a hand in making or problems that we've had a hand in solving. Um, so in thinking about our students, uh, it's okay that our students' projects don't always look like they're, they're ready to go on Instagram. They don't need to be perfect because with this maker-centered learning, it's so much more about the process of making than it is about the, the final product. So through that, that project-based learning or going through learning how to do those new skills or applying new skills to things that they're learning in class, uh, the students are they're building relationships. We're pushing them to, to go further next time. So say they're doing something or they're learning to use a sewing machine. Their next sewing machine project, they, they don't need that learning curve. They, they can just jump in where they left off and take it so much further. So just giving them those opportunities to iterate on their, their ideas and, and go further with it. There's so much more learning that comes from that process of making than necessarily that final product might, uh, might offer. So just something to consider with, with that, uh, that making that it can look messy at times, but there's still so much learning, that rich learning that comes from it. Messy is good. Messy, yeah. we can clean up. And then and that's one thing I just wanted to kind of pipe in with is that sometimes there's a hesitancy when you get a big box of equipment that looks super expensive. And like, you know, as a adult, we're like, oh, you know, I don't want to break it. But one of the best things is that if it gets broken, we learn to fix it. Um, and a lot of the times the students do that and they clean up their mess. And when they have um, ownership and they get engaged in these projects, less things grow legs and walk away or go, you know, get broke. There's really that care taken to appreciate the tools and materials they have. Nice. Uh, we just had a comment in the chat. Stephanie says, watching my students work through problems this year was the best part of my year. To step back and watch them through this process is just amazing. So I think that really speaks in. Stephanie is, is one of these uh, teachers that we work closely with here in Halifax area, and uh, she's done some incredible things this year. She just had a session, so watch, watch the recording for, uh, for her session as well. They shared a lot of the awesome projects they did. Um, so we hear from teachers sometimes that, like Sarah is saying, there's, there's concerns um, about teachers feeling like they, if they don't know how to use something themselves, they don't want to use it in their classrooms. So um, for us to get past this, our, our advice is to let making, uh, let, let learning be a playful process that you take part in with your students. Um, I, I've been there and I know that, that, is that there's that feeling or that to have that control, you feel like you need to know everything before the students do. And when you can kind of step back and let that go and let, uh, let the learning happen along with your students, 
it, it not only boosts your confidence, but it lets the students see like something authentic and they can almost learn from how you are learning. So they can see what you do when you come to something that you don't know how to do. So they can mimic that in the future as well. Um, so just that idea that play is a powerful teacher. So letting, uh, letting them have that opportunity to tinker and to figure things out on their own in really low stakes environments is, is really important, I think, for, uh, for making this maker center learning work. So to have these tools in the classroom, uh, have them accessible to kids. So if they have a few minutes, they can do some tinkering or if they have an inquiry question about how maybe, um, maybe a robot toy would um, go along with something they were doing in math, give them that chance to try and figure it out and see if they're right. Um, we use the word makerspace a lot. And some, uh, sometimes it's, there's a feeling for teachers that if you don't have a makerspace, then you can't do making. And, and we really want to kind of encourage you to, to think about your classroom as a makerspace. Um, the things that you do in your classroom can have making infused into them. It doesn't need to be something that is, is separate. So giving students a chance while they're in class, or maybe it's a, a once a week scheduled tinker time or like a, so I've heard the terms like there's figured out Friday, there's maker Mondays, there's uh, think it through Thursdays, there's all these different uh, things that teachers have have come up with so that their kids can have time to play and to explore different tools or their interests so that when you're doing activities later on, um, they, they've had that no stakes opportunity to learn the tools so that they can apply it to things that they're learning in the classroom. Um, We've got lots of Chromebooks these days in our classroom. So even just to think about uh, digital literacy skills. So for a student to take a, take a Chromebook and to know how to go about learning something new, like that's a skill all on its own. So like, to go back to that sewing machine example, if you go onto YouTube and you type in that specific model of sewing machine you have, most likely there's gonna be somebody that's posted a video that shows you how to thread the bobbin. Like you can, students yeah. can go out uh, without needing their teacher and learn and apply these independent learning skills. And we can we can foster that uh, that in our classrooms as well. Just, and that's, you really hit the nail on the head there, Jeff. It's just um, the the ability to be able to effectively Google and search and, and find those things um, to be able to do. I know that I've spent a lot of time um, learning how to do specific projects from you, young people. When I started five years ago, I had no, barely any code experience. Um, thank goodness, you know, that we're infusing this in the curriculum, but I was uh, really, I spent a lot of time learning and a lot of people I was learning from were, were youth, like teenagers. So um, they certainly, you know, if they know how to be able to effectively search and find it on their own, then, um, and then share that learning and then possibly even make their own tutorial videos for others to use. Um, that's fantastic. It also gives that extra boost of confidence that they're able to problem solve and then create a resource that could be utilized by um, their peers and me, people like me <laughs> sitting at home trying to figure something out why, you know, something the 3D printer is clogged a certain way. Um, it's out there. There's a lot of resources. We don't have to start from scratch because we're all working together. Yeah. Also, it, it fosters that in your classroom, you have experts in different things because students bring in their personal interests and they have things that they're really good at. So then it, it doesn't always become something that you as a teacher, people have to come to you for support. When you build that uh, that culture of, you know, of student experts, they get to go to each other and then they get uh, you know, that, that feeling of pride when they are the expert on something as well. It's really interesting because I've had an, numerous times where I've had teachers come on, you know, kind of pull me to the side and say that, you know what, this particular student is always really quiet, quiet and shy, um, but, since we're working on something that we usually maybe doesn't hasn't come up as a topic before they've really come out of their shell and became um, a leader uh, in gaining those leadership roles and I have one example in particular with a student I had at one of our makerspaces high school makerspace who um, from an O2 program he uh, initially asked to volunteer to help out um, with like sessions for his for his program for his uh, course and he ended up being like the custodian or the caretaker of the makerspace um, and he went, ran it at lunchtime um, and open it after school. He could develop resources for teachers and students. And at the end of the year, he was nominated for um, the 
lieutenant governor's award, I believe it was. So I did a recommendation. I don't believe he got it, but the thing is, is that when I met this young man, he didn't have a whole lot of confidence. Um, and he didn't feel like he was really fitting into school really well, but he ended up graduating. He's now attending an SEC for um, a me mechanical, uh, I believe he's working on me a type of mechanical engineering. Uh, and as well as we've employed him every year for our summer camps, um, you know, so he's gained job, he's gained uh, references, he's, and he's graduated and he's moved on, he's built confidence. And, you know, that's that's one of my big, my big, um, warm my heart stories so uh it's it's great to see that nice very cool uh so just to kind of wrap up this section we're talking about just maker center learning it's equal parts fun rigor and it's giving students that opportunity and a purpose to apply what they're learning in school so um so there's so many different kind of ways to say the same thing. So we say we're calling it maker center learning. There's yeah. project based learning. There's problem based learning. Uh, but I guess my my advice is in trying to bring in those authentic opportunities to use different types of making is to to take it like like find problems in your school or within the curriculum and offer it to the students as an opportunity to try and solve problems because they'll they'll come up with the solutions thinking about the things that they've had experience using. So if you know, if in those first few months of school, you've offered lots of these little, um, these opportunities, makerspace times, or, you know, figure it out times, or students uh, have learned about the different tools and how to use them that are in the classroom, when presented with a problem they can solve, those could be the tools that they, they try and bring in to solve the problem, or the, also those, those personal tools that they know from home or those skills that they've learned in other places get to come in and then that, that student's culture becomes a part of the learning culture as well. Very well said, Jeff. And then and it, it goes beyond the classroom too. So they take it home and they share it with their parents, their siblings, their grandparents. So it becomes... Um, not just a skill building, but a, a like you know a, a subject to talk about, um, and then that engages further learning. Where you know members of family or friends or community say, you know what, that's something I was interested in, and it, it's a continuous pattern of learning that is um, kind of like born within the classroom through maker centered learning, but it really blossoms. It's a ripple effect. Um, so as mentioned, uh, we do offer a lot of uh, in-class sessions um, or virtual sessions uh, or a combination of both, fingers crossed, that, uh, that we'll be able to support um, as well as the project funding that we offer. Um, uh, we have uh, original content for the Brilliant Labs uh, website. Uh, we have regular innovation challenges and um, we really... Um, look to reach out to as many people as we can. So for those, and we have many, you know, several different education centers, um, it's nice to also engage uh, teachers with each other to share their experiences, uh, what worked, what didn't work. And that's something that we would love to do. We, you know, having us on, following us on Twitter, um, Jeff and I each have our own personal account. We also have the Brilliant Labs account. And then we have a, a hashtag that is, uh, the hashtag is MakerEdNS, and when you put that in, you can see a variety of projects um, that are taking place or have taken place from within Nova Scotia, and then there's other ones for the provinces. Um, it's really a boat, even though we're kind of in a not so connected time period right now physically it's getting better we still have that ability to work together and and really get the conversation going so that you're not working in your classroom alone that you can get something going if you have a problem you can reach out to us of course by email if you're not on social media um we do have a facebook page as well uh but Twitter is, is a really great way. Um, during the year, we often do Twitter chats uh, on a particular day of the week where we'll discuss a certain conversation or a certain topic, sorry, um, to get that conversation going and keep it going because that's what we build on. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, if, you, if you're interested but you don't know where to get going um, and you do have access to Twitter, I would really recommend to go on there and to um, follow myself, Jeff, and Brilliant Labs or just Brilliant Labs if you want, and then you can look at the, what's happened in the past and what we have coming up. Nice. Um, so we do have a bunch of projects that we want to share, things that we have done both uh, when we've been in person, virtual supports, and uh, 
and some other ones as well in here. So I would just want to spend some time kind of just sharing some of the ways that we've helped teachers uh, or teachers have even, you know, come to us and we've been lucky enough to be a part of uh, with some of these linking curriculum to making kinds of projects. Um, so the first one was a grade five class and the teacher had the idea to uh, to do some 3D printing connected with her um, simple machines project in grade five. So thinking about the, the things that I had access to and she had access to, we came up with this idea based on something we saw online where the kids were going to use vegetables and turn them into race cars. So they had to design and test and you know iterate on their designs and print and reprint, make and remake um, different cars. And then we had our, our race day, like you can see in the little gif there. Um, so through this, the students were going through that design thinking process. They had to think about what was working when they tested it. Things, I don't think any of them worked the first time. So they had to go back and look at the measurement. They had to look at the shapes they were using and figure out what was making their car not work so that they were able to fix it and make a better car for the next round. So um, at the time, I was able to lend this teacher uh, a 3D printer to use. And she went on to uh, to apply for project funding through us to get her own because she's done some incredible 3D printing projects with her class since this first uh, initial experience with it. So that one was was a ton of fun. As you can as you can imagine, this video and the real version it's very loud. The kids were so excited to race these cars that they had made, and I just thought it was hilarious to see these carrots racing down the track. <laughs> I love that. We've used carrots in a few different ways, usually with makey makeys, but that's I think this is the first time that I've seen them <laughs> used with creating uh, uh, mini cars, go karts, if you will. Um, so the next one we have here is the terrarium project. So this is something that um, was done. So it was creating, we have a couple different versions of the terrarium project. This one was done with felting and some wearable. Um, so when I say wearables, I'm talking about microcontrollers that you can code and light things up and mimicking an ecosystem um, with non uh, bio non-organic matter um, to learn about the you know the aspects of like different ecosystems to be able to gain the skills of learning how to felt which is super fun I didn't really know how to do that until a couple of years ago and then the addition of adding um, a microcontroller encoding adding lights or if you want to add a sensor so that uh, perhaps the there, when movement happens or somebody comes to look at it, then the lights change. Um, another terrarium project that we did was actually building it within a, and I don't think I have it in my office here, but um, really cool. It was on our, our uh, community TV maker fun that, you know, getting a, like a large jar, a cookie jar, and getting different types of soil and, learn, and building with real organic matters um, or organic matter. And Jeff and I have been doing, a, well, we did a lot of uh, kind of natural makerspace stuff throughout the year. And sometimes you gather these things and you sometimes get little critters and bugs. Um, you know, and to be able to, it's essentially, if you don't, if you haven't seen one, it's essentially something that keeps growing throughout the year. And mine was, it's been it's over a year old. I did have one break, so we rebuilt it. Um, it's, and we're trying to do low waste, um, you know, to align with environmentally consciousness and the United Nations SDGs, but to be able to um, have the option of either doing it with the organic matter, like I mentioned, so gathering sand, dirt, like a plant. I even used an old house plant that was kind of like on its way out. So I translated in my terrarium and it thrived. Um, and the one here that we have on the screen is, like I said, something that's on the other end where it's not organic, but you're still getting the same, like what, what would we have in here? What kind of animal would live here? Um, what kind of species are native to our climate or environment super fun one of my favorite one of my favorite things to look at and there's so many different ways to do a terrarium project that uh it's uh, pretty open-ended and it doesn't have to be expensive either um this is one that i did while uh, i was still in the classroom so i guess it was a little over two years ago one of my favorites it was a ton of fun so yeah i actually i worked with an art specialist on this one and she helped us um, and you can see in the top left there, they're like wrapping a student in cellophane and then we use packing tape to literally make like a shell of, of a person. And then in each group, uh, they got to learn about a specific body system and decide uh, what parts of that system they were going to include inside that, uh, that person 
tape person and <laughs> how they how they were going to make it um, and and how they were going to display it and make it look like that system so they had to learn about the body systems they had to learn about the parts and how they were connected but then they also got to think about um, different materials and crafts so for example the lungs uh, i remember they made them out of paper mache so they got the balloons out they were paper macheing balloons but then the group that did the skeletal system uh, did a combination of they had this 3D printed skull. Uh, I remember they also for like the, the leg bones and stuff, they used like they were dog treats. They were like those long dog bones. Oh. They get to think about different materials and find different ways to combine things to make a really unique project that, uh, that was true to the personalities of the class. So when I say that was one of my favorite ones, well, first of all, you can see how much fun Jeff is having there in that <laughs> picture. You're always having fun in the classroom. But I, I think it's amazing because of the all of the skill building and learning and adapting, all of the different resources and materials used. And the outcomes were the same. They learned about the different systems, but there's so many different things like wrapping a body, like just troubleshooting how packing tape around a person. And... <laughs> I believe you might, I think this is one of the ones that went to Maker Fair and we had a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was, but yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's really neat that there's so many different ways of making incorporated into that one project is really impressive. And, you know, things don't always turn out beautiful, but this, this project was pretty, like, pretty accurate to what what was being done and this was what was this grade five, six? It was grade five, yeah. Yeah, grade five, yeah. So it was super impressive and you did a great job. Thank you. You mentioned Maker Fair. That reminded me, the group that took theirs to Maker Fair uh, did have a technology connection as well. They used Makey Makey to make yes. their their thing interactive. So when you touched uh, like the little metal button on the lungs, the computer, which was programmed on Scratch, would like verbally out loud explain how that body part works. So they had like four or five around the body different touch points where it would teach you about what they learned. So. Just that. Awesome. And, and that wasn't something that any other group wanted to do. And, and that was okay. Like this, it was something that this uh, group knew a lot about and was, they, was interested to do. So they came up with that on their own. They wanted to infuse yeah. that aspect. So that's, see, there you go. So they started off with uh, low tech and they said, hey, let's do this because they had already had that introduction to Makey Makey, which I think is so super awesome. And that's where the onus comes as far as the ideas. Um, next up is the uh, Roots and Shoots project. So Jane Goodall, the lady who's been spent a dedicated life to working with chimps and other animals has an institute or has a program called Roots and shoots. They offer um, grants to educators and schools to um, work on projects related to either animals, um, the planet, climate change, um, environment, indigenous um, people. So we um, we worked this year, over the past two years. COVID kind of the villagers put a little bit of a delay on it. Worked with the Prince Andrew High Makerspace um, to study. Um, the effects of climate change. So we, it was a grade 10 class and we haven't completely finished the project because when we switched to at-home learning, um, we kind of ended it there. We're gonna pick up though, but what we did was we used the micro bits. Um, so we have a couple of different sessions. One was to look at the greenhouse effect um, using uh, plastic bags and darker construction paper and having putting a micro bit inside of the bag um, and when it made a difference to have. So when you know, a greenhouse effect uh, similar to like, well, as you know, um, something being enclosed uh, like a greenhouse if you want to look at it and we looked at the difference in temperature change when um, something was enclosed in the bag for in near something dark um, versus not enclosed to see what the difference is and then also apply it to real world, world situations such as you know for example leaving a pet or a young child or anybody in a hot car how much of a difference that makes when you're in there and how over time how much it heats up um and also when you take one of the car shields you one of those ones you can get and you put it over how that can also change not that i recommend ever leaving anybody in a car but looking at how that um on a very small scale and taking that data and looking at the difference between the micro bits that were in the um greenhouses or the bags versus the ones that were not and then also the variables of the dark on um, a dark piece of construction paper versus a light piece of construction paper so we had a few different variables going on and looking at the comparison and, and having high school students grade 10 students um, 
you know, hy hy hypothesize what they thought would happen and then analyze what they did afterwards. And we also looked at, um, we made a, a flood tester and we talked about agriculture. So the importance of how um, the, the amount of water can truly affect uh, farming crops, especially, we have quite a few areas in Nova Scotia that are, you know, have agriculture and rely on agriculture, um, as well as the fact that we have had hurricanes that have flooded houses and a lot of damage. And so essentially the students at the end of that session were able to build a flood tester that uh, with the micro bit, um, a couple of alligator clips, some, a cup of water, and then how you can read, how you can create an alert so that um, when the water gets to a certain point based on what the situation would be, that they could um, create either like a you know a warning system so whether it be through text message or wireless um, connectivity whether you would have a sound or light but the students were really interested to see that what they made that day and came across with the, the what they built what they made and what they coded was actually relative to things that they could think about using in real life for example one student said they lost um you know some family photos i think in our last hurricane almost two years ago because they were in the basement um when another person had said that they had a an uncle that was a farmer and how important it was to really um to monitor the levels of moisture so by doing this project and looking at climate and how the things that we can build with something as simple as a make a micro bit um you know like a 20 a 25 dollar microchip you could essentially um, make something that's relevant and could be used with a little bit more um, additions for sensors and stuff like if it could send a text message um, how much of a difference that could make in somebody's life. Very cool. Um, similar to the next project as well. Um, this one was all centered around the idea of assistive devices. So in studying the human body in grade five, um, we started talking about different physical disabilities. And that led into this this inquiry and this like interest to learn more about different types of uh, of these physical disabilities that people are living with. So we talked to people from the Arthritis Society. Uh, a student even had um, had an aunt that came to speak to us and let us know about how what life was like with arthritis for her. And it turned into students uh, researching other physical disabilities and trying to come up with some kind of uh, assistive device that would make daily life a little bit easier for somebody that is living with that condition. So um, there's a video on this slide that we'll share at the end here if you're interested in seeing a little bit more. But as you can see from the pictures, there's a ton of different things, all very different from, uh, from pencil grips to something to hold grocery bags to the group in the bottom right, they're, uh, they're coding a micro bit, thinking about somebody with a vision impairment. So the idea being that there could be a micro bit um, at a place where there's a hazard, like the top of the stairs, and the person could have a micro bit with them. And the coding is if they get close enough together, it'll, it'll make like a noise. It'll, it'll make, sound like a little alarm. So they, uh, they found a way to get that coded so that if somebody walked close to the other micro bit, they could be warned of a hazard. So just really thinking about that empathy piece and trying to help somebody else uh, is, a, is a really powerful way to, uh, to bring making into the classroom. It's amazing. So next, this is a project that we had uh, completed a couple of years ago um, with a group of students who wanted to work on a peace project. And uh, it was a rural school. Um, they didn't have any previous uh, code or tech um, really much other than you know what they might have done I think it was a grade five class um, and they wanted to make uh, a flag or a quilt that represented peace in their mind so from their get-go they decided to do something of a deer and a wolf I don't have the picture of the whole finished thing and they wanted to show how they wanted to incorporate a river and the deer and the wolf on each side and to represent peace for them because usually a deer and a wolf wouldn't necessarily get around along in nature but then they wanted to incorporate they had a really lot of creative freedom with this one and then we added some microcontrollers we're using the circuit playground express so that they were able to add that as a main microcontroller and then add lights throughout the piece and code them so it, within this project they had a lot of the students had never sewed before so they were using measurement they're using um dimensions they had to really plan things and work together as a group um to cut make glue sew 
add the um, the tech parts and code it. So this was really an all-encompassing uh, project, and then they ended up displaying it at a, an open house that they had, and there was like they were really proud of it. So it was really great to see the amount of the different skills that they were um, learning and, and enjoying um, helping each other doing with this project. Um, this project is one that I worked on this year with a grade 10 uh, agriculture class in the Valley. So, uh, so this was all through virtual support. So the teacher contacted us and wanted to do something with renewable energy that's from her curriculum. Uh, so I got to try to remember the, the order of events here. So she applied for project funding with this project in mind. Uh, and once they were approved, she she gave the students in each of their groups um, a certain budget so the, the project they were they were approved for i think it was 500 dollars uh, in materials so the students were able to look at their their group's personal budget decide what materials they needed to complete their project and then uh, they submitted their their shopping list for their whole class and they got the materials that they needed um, and then they got to build their project so we had some greenhouse designs, some barn and farmhouse and windmills, and they were all just so different and using different materials. And, uh, and it was it was really cool to see a, a high school class doing something so hands on and and uh, it, it felt really unique. Yeah, for sure. It really links into the United Nations, um, you know, renewable energy and and really thinking into the future. I mean, it would, maybe renewable energy isn't in the future, but thinking about how they could apply to their, you know, within their own home or possibly within their future careers if they're interested in that. Yeah, and it, it really was like a like a real world learning situation because this is this is mm. a shift that farms around Nova Scotia are making to put in a wind power or solar panel on their farms. It's it's a it's an authentic task. And, and it's it is kind of a lofty endeavor too to figure out which one would be um, best for the actual location. So you know, not every area is suited to have a windmill, um, and you know, not every area is suited to have solar. So that the ability to analyze and decide. Um, you know, which would be best is a big part of the process. And that's a lot of critical thinking. Oh, okay, so pollinator habitat. So um, this is something that we really had a lot of fun with the at-home learning. Um, and the sessions are available on our YouTube channel, but uh, we we really wanted to focus. We took some time at prime time in the spring when we were doing at-home learning here in Nova Scotia to do some sessions um, to not only engage and teach about the importance of pollinators and linking it to agriculture and livelihoods and everything essentially <laughs> one out of every four things that we eat or drink um have been uh are, are a result of our pollinators and in the discussion we did at two grade levels um we also had the students build as jeff mentioned earlier in the presentation what we call a bee hotel or a pollinator hotel um and these are things that were made you can make like with things from around the home. So very low tech, but something that's really making the, um, and, and really enforcing the the importance of our pollinators and how that is linked to the food that we have, our environment. Um, and we did have a special guest too, who's a beekeeper. And then essentially, um, not that we are <laughs> the people who made them are dedicated beekeepers, but they're junior beekeepers because they're adding into, you know, helping protect the pollinator protection, pollinator population um, and having fun doing so. And that's actually a session that I did uh, virtually with uh, a couple of classes this week or a couple of camps this week and they really really had a great time um i did it with the younger kids who were like great their ages five to eight and then nine to twelve and both groups had as much fun as the other well of course the younger ones need a little bit more extra help from the mentors that were on site but at the end of the day they were just like blown away that well a lot of them want to keep it in their house so <laughs> the younger ones we had to we had to like kind of communicate that what going back to that but at the end um i like to say during camp like you know did we have fun because you know we want to have fun did we learn something and the answer was hurrahs all around so um that that was a big hit and like i said it's it it's pretty much you can make it for very very low cost thanks we've just got a couple left so i'll try and go quick on these last few yeah yeah um, so i had a, a grade 10 english teacher reach out and wanted to do some uh, something around movie making with her class so again, they applied for project funding from us and they got some green screen and some lighting material. And the project was uh, all about in their community, 
uh, an area here in the in the Halifax region called North Preston, uh, they wanted to to highlight some of the people there and how they felt about their community. So they got to kind of script out these interview questions, go home and talk to people that they know and film these little interviews, and they turned them into these mini documentaries. And it was really cool to see um, not just how they were applying these new movie making skills, but it was really personal to them. They got to pick the questions, they picked the people they talked to, which, which lines and quotes ended up in the film. So it turned into a really powerful project. Awesome. And I think this is the last one. Um, yeah, one I love you guys. Some uh, grade six uh, puppet theater. And this one started for a reason that I love is that a student in the class had a hobby outside of school of being a ventriloquist. So the teacher reached out to us and got a project grant for these materials so uh, that this student could become the expert in this project. So they were doing some reader's theater. Um, the students designed and made these, uh, these puppets. And then they got to act them out and, uh, and they were planning to go and present them for some younger students as well once they got these, these skits done. So just uh, bringing in making, but it had a, a purpose beyond curriculum as well. It was it really highlighted that student and they were just beaming throughout the day that that's something that was so uh, important to them was becoming a part of their school as well. So. And it really caught, it caught my son's eye because we went by a car dealership where it had one of those wacky, wavy, inflatable. <laughs> and he's like, there's the project that Jeff did. <laughs> it's like, but he was all the recognition of the, so I, I took sight of that actually Jeff's was mean by youth and that actually had more of a purpose than a drawing attention. But I just, I thought it was cute that it really stood out in his mind um, and then asked to, to make one himself. So that's on our summer checklist. Nice. And looking at the clock, it looks like uh, yeah. we're, we're right on schedule to be done. We did have some discussion questions, but uh, this forum doesn't uh, facilitate discussion too, too easily. So just to kind of, I guess, leave you with some things to consider as you go off on this beautiful sunny day. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. We can stick around for a few minutes yeah. or just send us off an email or, uh, or a tweet if you have any questions about stuff that we shared today or where you can get things or find things or how you can work with us. Um, we would love to to keep the dialogue open. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I recognize most of the names that attended today. And uh, like I said, we're we're always around um, to for support. And and you know, if you're inspired by any of the projects that you saw today, then and would like to replicate that, then uh, we can certainly help you um, doing that. Andrew's asking, how does someone get the B board? So commercially, Andrew, they are uh, they're not commercially available just yet. As for right now, we are uh, we're just supporting getting them into schools here in Atlantic Canada as much as we can. Um, like for example, the province of, of Newfoundland uh, in particular has kind of gone all in with B boards this year. So uh, that's kind of where the focus is right now. There are plans for for very soon once we kind of have the supply to do so to be able to uh, to expand these and get them out there to to people more readily. So we'll be in touch. I'll see what we can. Do in the future so we can do yeah available and the plan is to have them on amazon so <laughs> um but if you're if you're a teacher andrew then uh, you can reach out to us and you know we we'll figure figure it out of course um but yeah like to, it's, it's andrew's it's, joining it's... us from ontario today so that's oh <laughs> i'm sorry i recognize <laughs> andrew's name from before i just didn't yeah, i thought that him. maybe he was local hi thank you for coming from ontario you didn't have to travel but you're here so thank you yeah. <laughs> and don't ever go by my bitmojis because my hair is often different colors. I just don't <laughs> update it because it takes it takes longer for me to create one of those things than it does for me to do my hair. So it's either stay with one color or not. But um, you can, uh, I can I can assure you that regardless of my hair color, it's me and uh, Jeff and I are looking forward to working with you folks throughout the year. Right. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. This was uh, was fun to yeah get back into this, and hopefully, he found some inspiration going back into uh, into teaching this fall. So, well, we get look forward touch. to supporting you. Thank you so much.